Okay. So today, um, as you guys see the title, uh, by God's grace, we're going to talk about what is the purpose of service or why do we serve? And to be very honest, it's not going to be about like, it's not specifically why we serve the homeless. It's in general, why do we serve? Why do we come to serve God? Or what motivates us to serve? Or what is the reason behind service? So we're going to discuss that um, in three main points, which we're going to go over right now. But as we can see, the main point we want to discuss today is the question that Jesus asked Peter uh, when he met him um, after the resurrection by the lake. And he asked him, do you love me? St. John, John Chrysostom has this quote that we've shared previously. There is nothing colder than a Christian who does not seek to save others. Let's think about it again. There's nothing colder than a Christian that who does, who does not seek to save others. So simply, if you're truly a Christian that has like just a little bit of warmth, just the slightest warmth in you, being a Christian, you will want to seek to save others. You wouldn't be sitting there and um, caring less about someone from your family that does not know Jesus or someone that you've met that doesn't know Jesus. You would want to do something about it. You want to, you, you will be praying for the, for the salvation of people. You will be taking an action towards the salvation of people. Let's keep that in mind as we discuss today, what are the purpose or why do we serve in general? Why do we serve God? Let's start by reading uh, the last chapter of the Gospel of John, which goes, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee, the son of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had, had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore the disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciple came but the other disciples came into the little boat, came in the little boat, for they were not far from land but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragging the net to land, full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come, and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came, came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lamb. He said to him again a second time, Simon, the son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he's 
And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. As we can see here, it was Peter that said to them, I'm going fishing. This was the this was after Peter had denied Jesus three times and after the resurrection, but he kind of felt that there's no hope from him serving God anymore. There's no possibility that God would accept him again to serve him which is the same feeling we all have at different times in our lives. It might be a sin that we had just committed, or it might be doubt in our heart. It might be um, low self-esteem or thinking of that we're incapable of doing things. So if you can see here, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Although Jesus said to him, when he had first called him to serve him, what did he tell him? You will no longer be a fisherman, but a fisher of man. And it was clear that Jesus asked him, do not fish anymore. That's not your job, Peter. It's not your job. Your job is going to be way more bigger, way more important, which is the calling that we all get from God for a bigger calling, bigger than fishing. Some fish, it's to, to be fisher of men no matter what what our jobs are at in this life whether you are an engineer you're a doctor or whatever it is but there's nothing greater than being a fisher of men but many times we have the same feeling as peter we we think that okay i i cannot serve anymore i'm no i'm not worthy of serving god because of my sins because of this because of that and um Jesus comes and reminds us that the main criteria or the main reason to serve or the main thing that would allow you and I to serve is whether we love him or not. And that's why he repeated it three times. You want to tell me, you know, I know you denied me three times, but I know you still love me three times. I know you don't just love me three times. I know that you probably love me more than all these other people. I'm looking at your heart, Peter. I'm looking at your heart. Put your name instead of Peter here. I'm looking at your heart, Camel. I'm looking at your heart, Meg. I'm looking at your heart. I'm not looking at your capabilities. I'm not looking at your sins, Shady. I'm looking at your heart because you love me. If you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, tend my sheep. He repeated to him three times. He wanted to remind him. He wanted to restore Peter to be a servant of the Lord. So why do we serve God? We serve God because of these three things that we see on the on the on the screen. Because we love him, because we want repentance and because of faith. Let's go over them quickly. <clears throat> and um as I mentioned we shouldn't take more than 20 minutes. <clears throat> The first thing which we were just discussing, which is the cornerstone of service where, where everything begins is love. <clears throat> and when we say love, so when you ask yourself, okay, why am I going to serve the homeless this Saturday? Why am I trying to serve Sunday school? Why am I trying to go and do that service? The first thing that the, the first answer that you should say, because I love God. And I love his children. Everyone that loved God would love his children. And uh, that should be our first answer. If we have any other reason why we serve, we should question that. As we had just read, Jesus asked him, do you love me? Feed my sheep. And, and St. Paul says that 
because God loved him and he showed him love. He wants to share his love back. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm going to give him my life. I'm going to I'm gonna share back the, the love that he's given me because he loved me first. And I'm going to love him back. The first part was love to God. The second is love to his children. <clears throat> John. The Gospel of John chapter 13, it says, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you want to, if someone asks you, okay, you know what? The Bible is too big. I cannot read it. It's hard to understand then this is what St. Paul says in Galatians 5. The law is fulfilled in one word. Even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love. We also say God is love. The problem is in, in this time and age, the word love has become such a, unfortunately, um, it's sad to say, but it's become sometimes a cheap word to use. The use love about everything. They use the word love for instead of sometimes of lust or they use the word love instead of sometimes liking someone or just liking even um, a sports. They use the word love, but the word love truly is what St. Paul was saying here. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Love means sacrifice. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is what true love is. Not any other word that would falsely be used as love. So the first reason why we serve God is love. Love to God, love to his children. Why is love so important? I'm just going to quickly use one verse from chapter 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which, which is the chapter that talks about love, but I'm just going to use this word. And though I bestow all, the, all my goods to feed the poor, you're going to feed the homeless and you're taking all the money. You just zeroed your bank account. You, you took all the money out of your bank account. I bestow all my goods or I give all my goods to feed the poor. And though I give my body to be burnt... I'm not just going to take the money from all the money from my bank account. I even am going to burn myself just to satisfy the service. But have not love, it profits me nothing. St. Paul, imagine like you do all this, but for the wrong reason. You're willing to give all the money. You're willing even to die. But if you're doing this for the wrong reason, it profits nothing. Jesus, St. Paul here is saying that Jesus is looking for your heart. Why are you serving? Uh, am I serving just to keep the routine? Am I serving to just add it to my resume? Am I serving because it's a good thing to serve? Or am I serving because I truly love God? And though I bestow all the goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. This is how important love is. And this is why love should be where everything starts. Love is where every servant starts his service because he loves God and he loves his children. Love makes everything worth it. I'm not sure if you guys can see this picture clearly or not. It's um, Jacob and Rachel. It says here in Genesis 29, 20. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Actually, Jacob served for Rachel even 14 years because after these seven years, uh, he was cheated upon by his uncle Laban and he, he, he married Leah, then he married Rachel. When you love someone, you're willing to go so many miles for him. You're, going, you're willing to go so far for them. So when you love God, when you love his children, you're willing to stand in the cold out 
at the homeless service. You're willing to drive from far. You're willing to do things. Let us all today review our motives, our intentions. Why are we serving? Because without love, it's going to be really tough to continue. You may, if he didn't love her that much, he could have maybe served a year, maybe two, and then he would have given up. But he really loved her. He he had that love in his in front of him, and he continued to serve her, to serve for her seven years. Actually, he continued, as I mentioned, 14 years. A lot of people would come very motivated to serve. They like the atmosphere. They like, okay, let's do something different. They like the adventure. But without love, it's impossible for them to continue. Maybe they're coming for different motives. They want to meet new people, whatever it is. But we need to have to love God in order to be able to continue and persevere through the hardships of service. An example of love is St. Paul. Again, I would love to, sh to share how he looked at his children. My little children from whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. St. Paul describes his relationship with the people that he serves as a labor. Like when a woman gives labor, whom I labor in birth, he's he's saying like, you know, I'm going through so much suffering, just like a woman when she goes through so much suffering. I'm trying to give birth to you so that you look like Christ until Christ is formed in me. He's trying almost to say, I'm going to rebirth you again in, in the form of Christ. This is how much he loved them. And he says to his disciples and his spiritual children, just as it right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart. He's carrying them in his heart. It's that love. That's true love. A lot of you know that I love Abu Namina Abud, and I like to talk about him whenever there's a chance and without a chance. And uh, I'm just going to mention again, a great example of contemporary saint, Abu Namina Abud, his love for his children. As you guys can see, his love for God, his love for his children is a great example to learn from. Abu Namina Abud was, if any one of you is um, good with dates, look at, he was ordained a priest in March 2012, which was the time where there was no that was during like there was that was after the revolution there hasn't been morsi was um be, became a president i think in june or july 2012 so this time it was a really um period of unsettlement in egypt and where did he get ordained he was ordained in arish he's from cairo which is a pretty stable city relatively to Arish and he, he accepted to take the service and go to Arish and then you can see here he was martyred in after just a year and a few months because he was martyred after the after the ousting in Morsi and how all the Muslim Brotherhood and all the terrorist groups started to stir up riots uh, in many cities particularly in Arish with which was almost lawless at the time. He accepted the service. At the night of his martyrdom, he um, he was in charge of, um, of a student's dorms, Beit Talaba. He was in charge of like uh, Beit Talaba specifically, like a student's dorm uh, for the university at North Sinai. And he went out to check on them despite all that was going and happening. And he stayed with them all night. And then the next morning, uh, he, there's a lot of details. I would strongly encourage you to read his book, his story. And the next morning, they stopped his car. They shot him in his legs, several bullets, and they pulled him out of the car. And they asked him to deny Christ. He still said he will not deny Christ. And then they martyred him. Um, this is a great example of love. Love to death. And we're not talking about someone who's so far from us. He lived amongst us until very recently. He lived his life for Christ and died for Christ. 
this is the book if you guys ever have a chance it's called the spring of in sinai i strongly encourage you to get it uh you can get it as a for your christmas gift for yourself get a spring in sinai uh it's very well written by anthony marcus who's a dentist in the u.s it's a beautiful book so the first point we discussed today was the love the second is repentance the repentance as we said first we said love love to god love to his children repentance is divided into my repentance and the repentance of whom i serve but i discipline saint paul says but i discipline my body and bring it into subjection lest when when i have preached to others i myself should become disqualified as we get busy with service, we sometimes forget that we have to repent every single day. We have to come back to our Father of Confession. We have to keep an eye on our own repentance. We're not there to preach others. We are the ones to be preached. Hope Shinuda says in this um, sermon in 1993, your first job is search for your own salvation. Your second job is search for your own salvation. Your third job is search for your own salvation. And as you search for your salvation, you become a leader and light for others without asking for that. That's our main job. That's why we serve. Because we want to focus our own salvation, particularly when we serve Sunday school. If we're going to talk about a sin of lying, okay, am I going to lie and then ask them not to lie? So it helps us, keeps us on track. And then as we, so the first point was love to God, love to others. Second was repentance, my own repentance and the repentance of whom I serve. If you think we have any other purpose for service other than repentance, like, or like the fact that what is repentance? Repentance is reconciling with God. So we see that when John started his service, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The second Jesus, when Jesus started, began. It says here in Matthew four seventeen. When from that time Jesus began to preach. This is the beginning of his preach. What did he say? What was what was the message that Jesus said? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf: be reconciled to God. Reconcile. That's the that's our job, to re bring people that have lost their way, that have lost their ways in addiction, that have lost their way in um, different sins, reconcile them back to God, bring them together to God. That's the purpose of service. If, if you think our service, the purpose is just to, you know, make people feel happy, get them to church, get them to meet each other without having our ultimate goal. It's it's good to make people happy, bring them to church, get them to know hymns, get them to sing songs. All these are good things. But the ultimate goal or the main goal is reconcile with God, repentance. And before that, our own repentance. Many, many servants started serving God and they forgot their own repentance and they got lost on the way. Even particularly even like very big saint like not i don't want to say but saints but i mean ranks like arius for example that the heretic arius the heretic he was a priest nestorius he was a a bishop so we want to and they lost their way because they did not repent they didn't they weren't humble they had the, the pride came in the way and they went with their own thoughts so the first is love. Second is repentance, my own repentance and the people I serve. And then third is faith. This picture, by the way, is, is St. Seraphim of Saruv. Uh, in Arabic, Seraphim Serafiski is a pretty well-known saint in Russia. And he says, acquire a peaceful spirit and thousands around you will be saved. As you acquire a peaceful spirit, meaning when you, your own yourself, become repenting and uh, peaceful automatically people will be saved last point which will take two minutes is faith whose faith my faith and the faith of whom i serve so why do i serve because of love because of repentance because of faith 
if I really believe in that there is that God would reward everyone according to their deeds and that there's heaven and hell, I want to take an action about this. First, I want to serve God to be in the correct place serving him and doing his will. And because I don't want to see others perishing. The, the psalm says, I believed, therefore I spoke. So why do we speak? Why do we serve? Because I believe. I believe, therefore I spoke. And it's faith that keeps us going in service. If you don't believe in what you're doing, if you don't believe that God will reward you, or if you don't believe that there's a reason behind your, what you're doing, if you don't have faith, you're going to lose hope. You're going to lose track. You're not going to be able to withstand the tribulations and the afflictions and the tiredness of service. This is what St. Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet in the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. He's saying that, oh yes, we are going through afflictions. Light affliction. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen and temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. It's through faith that we are able to accept the afflictions and move on with the move on through the afflictions. And then the faith of the people whom I serve. We want to grow the, the faith of the people who we serve. And faith in general, we want to make sure that faith is divided into two as well. It's the faith meaning like believing in what God has given us in that relationship that you live by faith. And we want the people that we serve to live by faith. And it's also faith means the correct teaching. We want to make sure we're teaching the correct dogma, the correct faith, meaning like what we believe in at church. It's the correct teachings. St. Paul tells his children, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions. It's the faith that we want to grow. And as we mentioned earlier, it has to be the correct faith. And these things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. It has to be the correct faith of the Trinity, the creed, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give the defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. That's the apologetics parts in the service. As Saint, Athena, as, Saint, as Saint Basil says in the liturgy, as it was and shall be from generation unto the ages of ages. I mean, we, because we believe we want to share the correct faith and we want to move it from one generation to the other. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.